What makes Whitney Houston one of the best vocals of all time is very simple. She comes from a lineage of great singers. Dionne Warwick is her aunt. Her mother is the genius Sissy Houston, who sang background for Elvis Presley and for Dionne and for Aretha Franklin and for so many, and is a great lead singer herself. Uh, actually produced Sissy with Whitney on a song called I Know Him So Well from the play Chess, where they sang together. And in fact, the first time I met Whitney, her mom sang background on my, my first solo album called Garden Love Light, that song. And Whitney was 11 years old in the corner, and I met her just ever so briefly sitting there while her mom sang background. And her mom had this really church vibe, strong spirit church vibe she'd bring to any session. And it would uplift the music. So Whitney comes from that. Whitney comes from being around Aretha. Whitney comes from being around Burt Backer, Dionne Warwick. She's seen all that. So because she's absorbed it, it's in her blood, she was able to take, like most of the offspring does, what the parents give them and grandparents give them and kind of even go beyond that. Not everyone can do that, but the special ones can. The, the, the really gifted ones can. And over time, she did. She became the biggest female singer on the planet. Bar none. The world wasn't ready for it. The world wasn't ready. You have all that juice and like a 300-pound woman singing out of this 110-pound gorgeous model. The, the world wasn't ready for it. The hybrid. But once it realized it was real, she was off the races. Uh, I was making an album called Who's Zooming Who for Aretha Franklin, cutting Freeway of Love in 1985 at the Automat Studios. And in came a phone call from Arista Records' Jared Griffith about this brand new artist named Whitney Houston. He was so excited about Whitney Houston. And I really told him I didn't know if I had time to work with a new artist because we were so involved in the Queen of Soul, making sure we were getting it right for her. And he said, no, you got to make time for Whitney Houston. I said, oh, okay. Well, he sent me a song, and I said, the song I want to rewrite a little bit. It was called How Will I Know, written with George Merrill and Shannon Rubicam. And so I just took a little time out of the Aretha session and tracked a song called How Will I Know. Then flew to New York and met Whitney and put her vocal on it. And in meeting her, she was so thin and so beautiful. I was, I always tell the story, I was like shocked how powerful she was, singing, there's a boy! I know he's the one I dream of. And then she come back and listen to the playback in the, in, the, in the control room and sit back in the chair. You know, like she's been doing it all of her life. You know, like look at me kind of cocky, like, yeah, I know I sound good. And I said, damn, you sound strong. Yeah, okay, thank you. And you know, she'd be so confident about it, like, of course I sound good, you know. Well, you, you, you're, you're, you're startled, I sound good kind of thing. That's how it was. In making the first album, I only had one song, How Will I Know? And that became the fourth single. They had three other singles first. I think it was You, you Give Good Love, which was intention to make the Blake a, to break a black radio, to befriend our R&B stations. And it did. Then I think came Sitting on the Left for You. And that became R&B and pop everywhere, number one. If I'm not mistaken, it could have been Greatest Love of All. And then when they put out How Will I Know as a fourth single, it was the fastest rising number one, because by that time now, after the battles, three battles in a row, we were, we were ready to party. And it just flew to the charts. Did I know it would be as big as it was? As many millions and millions and millions? No. What I knew was hot. I knew it was exciting. I knew the, hand, the hairs on my hand were standing up. I knew she was laying back in the chair like, yeah, what do you want to say? Huh? What, what do you want to say? So I knew all that was going on. I knew she was gorgeous. And when I saw the video on how long, I was like, damn. I know she's hot, but she's working the cameras, man. She's working the cameras. Hard. So, you put all that together. Millions and millions and millions. I think it shocked all of us. We knew she'd be big, but I didn't realize it'd be that big. But God bless her heart. She had it like that, and people love her like that. In the making of her second album, when a lot of people get what's called a sophomore jinx, after you have a massive first album, I said, well, are you nervous in making the second album? We were in New York City at the, um, the studio, Right Track Studios. You know, like making like so emotional vocals, something like that. And I said, are you nervous? She said, no. If they love me the first time, they'll love me now. I said, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. And she meant that mess. And out came the second album and it flew out the can again. Huge. And they're making the third album. So she's always of that nature. I only felt because of the, the, the run that she was on, being so busy for so long, on the third album, I, I felt we gotta really slow it down. 
because she needs some time now. Then I really felt like, wait a minute, come in the session, make a prayer, light the candle, make it really peaceful, and you know, so that she can just be at, at peace with it, and then grow into the songs. So, All the men I need, I belong to you, and feel so good. These are Clive's picks, by the way. Clive Davis picked these songs. And Clive Davis picked all the songs. And so God bless Clyde for that, and God, God bless Eris Records for pushing her very hard. But on the third album, I could tell we had to slow it down and just give her time to kind of breathe, because you don't understand, man, she was just like a jet rocket, a jet rocket, and has more awards than any other female singer on the planet because of it. I mean, she just did so much work everywhere, everywhere. The making of I, I Wanna Dance Somebody Who Loves Me. So happy. Don't you wanna dance, say you wanna dance, don't you wanna dance? Say you wanna dance, don't you wanna dance? Say you wanna dance, damn. Don't you wanna dance? All those riffs and stuff having fun with, just pouring out of her. Just ideas, cause she got the spirit. She got hot with the spirit, so out it flies. That happened on every song. That happened on every song. In London, recording her vocal of the Olympic theme song, One Moment in Time, sang it beautifully. And in particular, the ending last note, beautifully. I think George Martin came in, who was a Beatles producer, to watch it a little bit. Had the London Symphony strings around, playing as well. And in this massive room, she just let her heart pour out on that song, and you'll hear it if you listen to it. She was very Christian-oriented, loved Jesus, loved God, loved her Savior and Jesus Christ. She would speak about that daily and feel better after speaking about it and feel more grounded after speaking about it. So that was really her staple and that was how she dealt with fame and dealt with the speed of the whole game her love of God and her knowing that God had a higher purpose for her and taking time to reflect on that purpose and we would pray about it and then we'd also go to a piano and I might play Alfie I might play some walk on by and she would sing it real soft because she knew all those songs and then that would make her feel good just anything like that in those spirit worlds that's how she dealt with fame. Because truly, she, although she was huge, in her mind, she was still very approachable to people who loved her and that she, that she loved. She was never this kind of diva where you couldn't approach her. She'd be always happy to see you, happy to hug you, happy to give you a kiss. How's your family doing? How are you doing? All that kind of behavior. So yeah, she was enormously famous, but at the same time, very humble because she was a God lover. Really loved the, the, the spirit of the Creator love the spirit of Jesus, love the spirit of humility and do good. And she would often playfully say, if someone didn't do, didn't do right, oh, they're going straight to hell. Oh, they're going straight to hell. And we laugh about it. Part of our charm together, our, our love for each other, was she knew I would get in a three hour session, almost the entire song done out of a three hour session. So we kind of enjoyed working with each other because we knew it'd be fun. We wouldn't kill each other and we can get fantastic number one results almost every time almost every time and in breaking the Beatles record seven number ones in a row a song called where Do broken hearts go Clyde found the song brought the song to us it was my job to make that song really come to life for again the, the ghettos the, 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 the juke joints and on NASA's boat you know everywhere all people everywhere we don't leave anybody out and in doing that, it's gonna have an outhouse bottom with a penthouse view. You put that combination together, you can't lose. But she, she easily loved what she did. That's, that's what I'm telling you made it so enjoyable. Most enjoyable. And she could dig it right away if the vibe was hot, man. Then you, then you see like Mick Jagger, now he wants to run in there on So Emotional. Wow, let me hear it. And you play it for him and he's dancing around. Those type of things were always happening. B.B. Wine is gonna come in. B.B. coming so much, I bought him a, a blanket called it B.B.'s Blanket so he could lay on the back couch and sleep. Her father walked in, very chiseled man, beautiful high cheekbones. And, you know, very like Cary Grant, distinguished and regal. And the session would stop. You say, you know, what do you need to spend time with her father? And you could see, see them sit and talking. And you want to know, are you taking time for yourself? Are you enjoying everything? Are you, are you going slow enough where you can catch your breath? And, you know, like that, like a real father concern. And, you know, she'd be so loving to her father. So that was a wonderful thing to see. We don't talk about that very much, but John Houston was something else. Beautiful, beautiful man, very striking. Her mom being around was gorgeous because she just wanted to always be so supportive. And she, again, 
loved the sound of her daughter's voice and kept it fun. Because you know, in the business, it can be hard. But in, the, in where we are right now, in the studio, in studios, it's like a sanctuary. Everything positive, nothing negative, everything positive. If it's, if it's something negative, you cut it out. You make it sound positive. You fix whatever's not right, so it's all positive. It's like a surgeon. You make everything right. You make everything feel good. And that's our job as producers, and that's our job as artists, to bring that good emotion. Now, let's say it's a really tender song, or really, maybe even a sad song. Then you have to go there too. Lower the lights down. Put the blues on. Put the blue lights, the very dimmed. Make that atmosphere for her. Make it really, so she can feel what she's singing. Most important, because there again, the hardest part is getting the mood that you can now believe what you're singing in all these different songs, like a character in, a, in a different movies. You're playing the character in different movies. So now in singing Where Do Broken Hearts Go, you have to get your heart in a place of, of flux, of, of, of very vulnerable, naive, tender, broken-hearted feeling, and you take a moment to get into that gear. Maybe you sing some broken-hearted Dionne Warwick type of song. You know, what's it all about? And you lower the lights way down. And you take a moment to reflect on what that feel, feels like and get into it. And then you deliver it. So that's the part that that's the hardest, to take that time to shift the gear. Once you're there, it flows. Because you want to make sure everything you do and everything you sing is felt. Is felt. And she was a goddess of portraying her feeling. So much so where she could turn around and make Bodyguard, which was her first film, number one box office, because she can translate her feeling with her face, with her voice, with her emotion. She's just got that gift. She'd always say, you're the most gift givenest man. I said, what? You're the most gift givenest man. I said, okay, thank you. Every time I saw her, I'd give her a gift. I'd give me a talking watch, a teddy bear, a bear that would talk. I'd pre-record these long cassettes on with me talking like in a really weird voice. Yeah, what's going on, girl? I put that tape in the bear, so the bear, yeah, what's going on, girl? Had this long dialogue, just to then crack up at it. Those are the kind of things we would do, just have fun together. Every time I've been with her, it's been an eye-opening experience. An eye-opening experience, because I re-realize again, when you think you know someone, because you do know them, but they keep growing, so they're not, they're not the same person every time. They're a different person every time, because they're, they're, they're growing. She grew so fast. And what she wanted to achieve for herself became deeper and higher. But I will say this, she was so confident, she loved herself, loved her voice, loved what she did. So it was always an enjoyable experience. Growing, yes, but always fun, always enjoyable. And the spirit is in those records. The spirit, she consciously, we consciously, we all consciously were able to bottle that when God walked through the room, get that on the tape. That was our achievement, and that was something we're both very proud of, we're all proud of, in her music, her legacy.